My name is Al Rain, and I'm the co-chair of Boston Harbor Now's Policy and Planning Committee, and I'll be the host for this morning's forum. Boston Harbor Now convenes these forums to enable public discussions about projects happening around the waterfront, whether they're public or private sector projects. If this is your first time at a Harbor Use Public Forum, welcome. And if you've attended before, we're glad to have you back. A, a word about Boston Harbor Now. Uh, we're a nonprofit focused, among other things, on ensuring that the waterfront and the harbor islands are increasingly prepared for the impacts of climate change and that they provide welcoming and inclusive open space and indoor uses to people from all over greater Boston. We call this vision of an equitable, resilient, and accessible waterfront Harbor Walk 2.0. Our work spans a wide range of issues from commenting on waterfront development projects to planning for future ferry service to bringing underserved communities out to experience the Harbor Islands. Boston Harbor now believes strongly that the waterfront belongs to all of us and that by bringing together interactive conversations like this one, we can help ensure that projects are both inclusive and resilient. Today, we're excited to hear from our partner organization, the Stone Living Lab, an innovative and collaborative initiative for testing and scaling up nature-based approaches to climate adaptation, coastal resilience, and ecological restoration in the high energy environment of the Boston Harbor Islands National and State Park. We'd like to do two, two quick polls uh, just to learn more about who's here today. And uh, Kelly, uh, yeah, you're putting those up. Uh, the first one uh, is to ask where you're joining from uh, and the choices are uh, that you live or work in Boston, in greater Boston, in Massachusetts or further afield. And the second one, when you're done filling in the first, is to ask how familiar you are with the Stone Living Lab. And the choices are very familiar. You've collaborated with them on projects and programs. Somewhat familiar, you've been to events hosted by them or seen their work. A little familiar, you've heard about them uh, or not familiar at all. And this is your first exposure to them. And uh, Kelly will show us what we've got as soon as the results are mostly in. Great, I'm gonna give everyone a few more seconds. Three, two, one, okay. All right, we have we have nobody from further afield. Uh, most most folks here are from uh, Boston or nearby, and uh, ah, a fair amount of people are uh, are quite familiar with the Stone Living Lab. That notwithstanding, let me say a word about them before I introduce our speakers. The Stone Living Lab is a partnership among Boston Harbor now. That's us, uh, UMass Boston School for the Environment, the City of Boston, the Mass Department of Conservation and Recreation (DCR). The Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, the National Park Service, and the James M. and Kathleen D. Stone Foundation. The Stone Living Lab engages scientists and the community in research, education, and the promotion of equity. Their mission is to innovate and implement nature-based approaches to protect vulnerable coastal regions through a collaborative, equitable, and applied science approach. Today, we're joined by two presenters from Stone Living Lab, We'll talk about their research and education programs. Joe Christo, the managing director of the Stone Living Lab, and Rebecca Shore, the senior program manager of education and engagement. And after their presentation, we'll open this up to Q&A. Joe and Rebecca, take it away. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you, Al. Um, can, can you all hear me okay? Great. Um, I will share my screen now, and Rebecca and I will jump into the presentation. Um, I'm going to go to slideshow here. And is that shared in full screen? Yes. Awesome. Um, so thank you so much for joining this morning, everyone. I uh, really look forward to, to talking about um, the work we have going on at the lab right now and, and having a good discussion um, afterwards. Um, we'll do a, a couple of uh, uh, introductions, a little bit of background on both of us. Uh, I'm, as Al said, I'm Joe Christo, the Managing Director at the Stone Living Lab. Um, I've been at the lab for about a year and a half. Uh, as he mentioned, we're a, a really unique and innovative partnership um, between Boston Harbor Now, UMass Boston School for the Environment, and federal, state, local government, as well as many community partners. Um, 
prior to the lab, I was with the city of Boston as the city's senior resilience and waterfront planner. Um, spent some time on their civic innovation team before that. And prior to that, had been with the city of New York, um, uh, most recently there helping lead a lot of the Hurricane Sandy disaster recovery efforts. Um, and, and just love the work that we get to do with the lab. Uh, collaborative, innovative, um, and, and really uh, timely. Um, so I'll uh, pass it to Rebecca to, to introduce herself as well. Thanks, Joe. So my name is Rebecca Shore. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Senior Program Manager for Education and Engagement. I've been at the lab a little over three years now, and my role has been creating and implementing our education and engagement outreach. So we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but it can be everything from pop-up programming to presentations to curriculum development. Prior to the lab, um, I've worked for a number of different conservation organizations, particularly focused on participatory or citizen science, as well as doing public programming. So I've worked for organizations like the Isaac Walton League of America, Mass Audubon, and several other small nonprofits. And excited to share some of the work we're doing today and hopefully spark some new ideas and maybe new partnerships. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so I'll, I'll jump in um, and talk about um, our, our mission and vision um, to help set the stage a bit. So, so the lab is is really working to to innovate and implement nature based approaches. We're calling them now, not solutions, but uh, nature based approaches to protect vulnerable coastal regions through a collaborative, equitable, and applied science approach. Um, we do that to help create a future where people work with nature to make coastal regions resilient and adaptive to climate change, while enhancing natural and built environments. Um, and we're going to talk today about what that what that looks like. Um, this is uh, the range of partners working on the lab, as uh, Al had covered and uh, as, as, as I did as well. And um, we have our, our funders, uh, some of our funders, we have a, a few additional ones uh, now on the left, uh, primarily funded by the James M. and Kathleen D. Stone Foundation. Um, and we're just really appreciative for, for all uh, the partners, not, not only um, our teams at Boston Harbor now and UMass Boston, who are the two anchor partners where, where all the staff for the lab is housed and, and that serve as, as funding conduits, but, but the National Park Service, the city, and our, our state partners as well. Just a really wonderful mix of, of people that, that are working towards collaborative goals. Um, so... Nature-based approaches um, are uh, a field that is uh, evolving uh, in a lot of ways. Um, it's similar to green infrastructure, but it's essentially people working with nature to incorporate strategies that mimic natural systems to address climate hazards, ranging from sea level rise, to flooding, erosion, drought, and extreme heat. Um, they not only... Um, uh, Research has shown, shown thus far that not only do they help protect regions from things like coastal storms and sea level rise as good as, if not better, than uh, traditional granite seawalls, um, but they also have a range of co-benefits. These co-benefits range from um, improving biodiversity in the areas where they are, improving quality of life for area residents, helping with carbon sequestration, uh, working to manage stormwater better, um, we have some really nice images from uh, one of our fellows, uh, Rocio, in, on the right side of the screen here that, that shows sort of the difference in, at the top between a, a traditional granite seawall um, and then below uh, between a, a, a living shoreline um, with a boardwalk running through it as well. So examples of nature-based approaches run from those type of living shore shorelines and salt marshes to cobble berms, to coastal dunes, um, to uh, shoreline uh, berms, to offshore boulder fields, and, and a whole range. And we'll, we'll talk about a few of those today. Uh, Rebecca, anything to add on nature-based approaches? No, that's great. Cool. Um, so our the lab has four areas of focus. Um, uh, those are, are research and monitoring, which is really the the core of, of what we're doing. Uh, there's been uh, there has been some research on on the uh, effectiveness of nature based approaches to address climate adaptation, um, but uh, we have found that that there are, are big pieces uh, of that research that are missing um, to really help show uh, their effectiveness, help 
um, really uh, paint a nuanced picture of, of how they can benefit uh, especially urban coastal areas is really our focus. And, and so that's why the lab exists. Um, the, the, some of the inspiration for the lab came from uh, 2018 storms uh, that affected Boston pretty significantly. Um, a team from uh, the Boston Harbor Ireland's partnership, um, as well as other collaborators, had uh, worked with Woods Hole Group to notice that during those two storms um, in early 2018, there had been offshore waves of 10, 15 feet um, uh, eastward of the Harbor Islands. And by the time they got to the shore of Boston, they were about two feet. And that the team really thought, all right, wow, um, how can we, A, work to better continue protect the islands? B, what are the islands doing that we can help enhance and mimic both on the islands and on the shoreline of Boston? Um, and the city of Boston, being a close collaborator, has really focused on a nature-based approach for a lot of its climate-ready Boston work um, and their coastal resilience solutions neighborhood plans. Uh, so uh, the research and monitoring is meant to help support cities like Boston, um, as well as neighborhood groups, residents, um, and, and fellow uh, academic researchers as well. Um, our education and engagement work is, is just as important to um, to what we're doing as, as the uh, research and monitoring. Rebecca will go into detail about uh, that uh, shortly. Uh, and we also work on policy innovation and climate preparedness. The climate preparedness is really social resilience. How are we bringing people together um, to, to engage in this work uh, from residents to practitioners um, to uh, fellow academics. Um, uh, we do that through things like our conference, our biannual conference. It was uh, most recently in 2023, will be in 2025 as well. Uh, we brought about 300 people to the UMass Boston campus um, for a really, really wonderful two days. Uh, our monthly seminar series is another way that we do this um, climate preparedness work. Um, so this is just a quick slide with, with some of our colleagues, including one former colleague, Melanie, um, uh, showing uh, the team analyzing some sites for our Living Seawalls project. But um, it, it's just to reinforce that there's really an exciting time for nature-based climate resilience globally, nationally, and locally. And, and the lab is, is central to uh, efforts at all these levels. Um, uh, shortly after this picture was taken, we, we got to uh, participate in the Earthshot Prize that was in Boston in uh, December of 2022. And, and we really like to focus our partnerships um, locally here in the city of Boston, but also regionally and nationally and globally as well, um, working with uh, folks from as far away as, uh, as Australia and our Living Sea Walls partnership. Um, so, our core research and monitoring projects. Um, we have four of them right now, and I'll, I'll give a, a short overview of, of each. The first one is is the Living Seawalls Partnership. Um, so uh, as I, I mentioned, this was established as, as part of the 2022 Earthshot Prize. Um, the Living Seawalls team, and that's capital L, capital S, they're a team out of Sydney, Australia, um, from the Sydney Institute of Marine Sciences. They were a um, finalist in the first Earthshot Prize in 2021. And as the second Earthshot Prize uh, was coming to Boston, uh, we worked with the organizers to um, to build on some work that the Stone Living Lab had done previously, uh, uh, researching living seawalls as a approach, lowercase l, lowercase s, to partner with this team um, and really implement their first installation um, in North America. They've worked uh, throughout uh, Australia, as well as in parts of Asia and parts of Europe, um, but they have not worked in, in North America and we are really excited to do so. We're working towards an installation actually happening um, within the next couple of months. We're hoping for, for late March and, and early April at two project sites, one, um, in East Boston at Condor Street Urban Wild, and another in uh, the Seaport at Fan Pier. Um, as I mentioned, Sydney Institute of Marine Science is a, a really close partner in that work. They've um, we've worked hand in hand on these uh, designing the panels, 
Um, but but we've had wonderful partners at uh, Boston Children's Museum as well for education and engagement, as well as the city of Boston, um, as they're a, a property owner for one of the sites, um, uh, Fallon Group, uh, who's a property owner at another sites, and, and several other partners as well. Um, and, and the goal of this project is not so much about um, mitigating sea level rise and, and coastal storms, as many uh, much of our other research is, um, but more so about dealing with other effects of, of climate change, especially um, uh, the shortening intertidal zone and the effects on biodiversity that that has. So it's really about investigating the ecological benefits on built structures in Boston Harbor, making these existing built structures um, more green, making gray infrastructure more green and more um, habitable to uh, a range of, of uh, aquatic life. Um, and hopefully in the process, improving water quality in the area, um, as well as maybe providing some uh, mitigating benefits uh, for um, for a storm surge. Um, so we're going to be investigating all, all three of those things. Um, the second project I want to give a quick overview of are, are cobble berms. Um, cobble berms are uh, naturally occurring, but also uh, designed um, and supplemented and, and installed. Um, it's a, a range of, uh, as the name indicates, cobbles um, uh, along a shoreline um, that helps uh, uh, slow erosion and also mitigate wave energy from coastal storms. Um, there are six sites in eastern Massachusetts that were um, researching. We're working with municipalities to um, look at everything from how the, the cobble berms are moving to how people are interacting with them um, to really sharing uh, education and engagement work to help other municipalities learn about the permitting process. Um, so this is a, a really exciting project. Another name for cobble berms are dynamic revetments, which I think is a little bit more descriptive of what they actually do. Um, they shift and move with wave energy and, and reform themselves. They've proven to be a really, um, uh, in preliminary research, effective means of, of protecting coastal shorelines um, and the neighborhoods behind those shorelines as well, um, and, and also uh, do so at a, a lower cost than something like a traditional granite seawall. Uh, those traditional granite seawalls can oftentimes increase erosion and scour um, uh, uh, around and beneath them, um, while these uh, cobble berms are, are shown to really uh, help prevent it, um, which is something we want to continue to look at. Um, as uh, it's in partnership with the Massachusetts Office of Coastal Zone Management, who has uh, provided some uh, some supplementary funding in addition to the funders that uh, I mentioned on the um, uh, one of the intro slides, along with Woods Hole Group and the Duxbury Beach Reservation. Um, as I mentioned, it's investigating flood protection and erosion control throughout eastern Massachusetts. And um, we have a range of professional development resources and trips for municipalities. Um, Rebecca is going to jump in and talk uh, uh, more in the education and engagement section. But Rebecca, do you want to share anything about the upcoming planning for uh, some of the work we have in 2024 around cobble berms? Yeah, absolutely. So I can speak to some of our education and outreach that we've done as part of this project. So not only, as Joe mentioned, are we monitoring these sites for changes, effectiveness, how folks are interacting with the sites. We're also um, concurrently creating outreach and training opportunities for professionals. So these are folks from at municipalities ranging from conservation commissions to restoration professionals, DPWs, the folks who would actually be permitting, planning, and maintaining these kinds of sites. And so um, last year, we actually gathered a focus group of municipalities to make sure that our programming served their needs. We ran several field courses to bring people out, start to ask questions, explore these sites. And this year, our project is culminating with the production of several fact sheets that, you know, one pagers that folks can use uh, some instructional videos were really excited, including some storm footage of how these cobble berms behave in storms, and then some more field courses. And these courses will be a little bit more in-depth. They'll include uh, opportunities to actually try out monitoring techniques, so things like aerial drone footage, salt marsh surveying, and then also some time spent with a Q&A and a panel discussion with 
the town of Hull. Uh, so the town of Hull is considering implementing one of these strategies for their own um, coastal needs. And so having different staff meet each other and start to talk about some of the challenges and how they went about making decisions on, on implementing these solutions. And especially one of the, the biggest barriers to these nature-based approaches is often the permitting process for folks. It can be expensive, timely, and it's a challenge to know which agencies are the right ones, who are the different, what are the different metrics that people are using. So also connecting those professionals in that way. Um, and really, again, as Joe mentioned at the top, building that sort of climate social resilience, making sure folks know who they need to know and get the opportunity to learn and share from one another. So those events are actually beginning to be listed on our website, which we'll um, have at the end. And um, those are welcome to anyone. So if this is something you're interested in and getting out in the field, we have lots of opportunities for that this spring. That's awesome, Rebecca. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Real-time monitoring in Boston Harbor. Um, uh, if uh, I think many folks on this call are, are quite familiar with the, the lab and have been to our events. So you may have seen our very own Rebecca Shore standing right here, um, sometimes in uh, ankle deep or, or shin deep water uh, during our Wicked High Tide events. Um, but this image here is is uh, showing uh, one of our pieces of monitoring equipment. This is a Hohonu Overland Water Sensor that is measuring uh, water depth on Long Wharf here. It's part of a, a broader network of uh, monitoring equipment that we have throughout the harbor uh, in partnership again with Woods Hole Group, one of our closest collaborators. So that ranges from... Uh, and, and this project, I should mention, is in partner, close partnership with the city of Boston as well. Um, and so those uh, uh, pieces of equipment include four of these Hohonu sensors uh, here at Long Wharf, another one in East Boston, and two more in Dorchester, one along Morrissey Boulevard and another at Tinian Beach. Um, they're all measuring um, overland water um, depth during storm surge events. Um, I took this image on February 13th. Um, the water depth here uh, got to about uh, almost two feet that day. But on January 13th, it had gotten to over two and a half feet, which was the um, uh, largest, uh, the, the deepest scientifically observed uh, water level ever on Long Wharf. So really gathering more baseline data to help plan and address um, climate change and, and work with partners on climate adaptation. Um, so again, the network includes those four sensors and we're looking to install two more uh, as well. Another one in East Boston and potentially one a little uh, further upland um, uh, along the Charles River. Um, it includes uh, wave buoys as well um, and meteorological stations and a tide gauge. Um, so all of this is in service of collecting better data about changing climate conditions, uh, sharing it publicly. All of the information is, is uh, open data that's shared publicly to help uh, local municipalities, community groups, residents, academics better understand the changing dynamics and conditions and help incorporate that data into things like um, uh, future flood projection models, uh, as well as uh, planning um documents and approaches and, and best figure out how we can utilize this data um, to better understand the changing conditions and plan for them. Um, this shows a, a few of the highlighted locations uh, of these instruments. And as I mentioned, it's in partnership with the city of Boston. Um, some of the uh, areas that they're measuring are water quality, wind, water levels, wave height, um, and other factors. And, and yeah, um, uh, please uh, visit our website to check out the observations from January 10th, January 13th, and February 13th, where um, uh, the, the network was fully in place. This is a relatively new project, just having launched um, in September of 2023, um, but we really had some, some amazing observations from those storms. Uh, we have, uh, well, there's one other project that we don't have a slide about here. Our, our fourth core research and monitoring project is actually a, a partnership with um, with Camp Harborview. Uh, the lab is not a, a consulting group, but but we're kind of operating a little bit as one uh, for this uh, project with a close partner at Camp Harborview um, out on Long Island, which is just an amazing camp for, for youth from around the region. Um, and they are on a very 
vulnerable part of Long Island and want to better understand what that vulnerability looks like. So we are um, collecting a lot of baseline data, doing some analysis and working with them on helping understand what the conditions look like now and in the future um, on their location. And then we're also going to be um, incorporating that into some education and engagement work and lessons for their campers this coming spring and, and summer as well. Um, so really, really exciting holistic project um, that, that we have going on there as well. Uh, but we also have some socioeconomic research, three reports that will be released this year um, in partnership with um, a, a Better City, uh, Salem State University, and um, UMass Dartmouth around uh, greening the blue line uh, for stormwater management, uh, the use of social media to estimate visitation at nature-based approach sites, and um, uh, policy and regulatory measures to better ensure that benefits and co-benefits of nature-based approaches can accrue to socially vulnerable populations. That one's really about environmental justice. Um, there's also some great work going on from our, our research a researcher uh, Jessica Loquist around uh, policies for for implementation, and and she'll actually be uh, defending her dissertation uh, next month um, for that as well. Uh, last piece before I hand it to Rebecca is about sharing the work. Um, if you haven't already, please check out our quarterly summary. Um, we uh, launched our first one in in late. Uh, 2023 and and our second one is now up online as well uh, that, that was released in january it really gives a, a full um uh, sort of overview of of the current research projects and and some preliminary observations and findings as well um it goes into detail on our education work as well it's, it's the uh, best place to find uh, exactly what's going on at the lab um each quarter um so rebecca you want to take it away on education and engagement absolutely so as we've been mentioning, um, the education and outreach and engagement work of the lab is something that we're doing hand in hand with the research. So either using research to inform the kinds of programming we want to do or addressing the topics that our research is covering with audiences of very different age, location, residents, visitors. Um, and so each of our sort of buckets of programming addresses different audiences and different topics. You can go to the first slide. So one of the first things that we did when I first came on board and we were starting to formulate what do we want our education and engagement programming to look like was we did some, some deep thinking and did some thought exercises about these coastal resilience principles. So what are the three big topics that we want people to walk away with when they have an experience with us, when they use some of our educational materials, when we work with students, et cetera. And the three principles that we came up with as a partnership working group were coasts are adaptable, constantly changing systems at the interface of land and sea. Natural and social communities are interconnected in coastal areas and beyond. And we have the ability and responsibility to determine our future relationship with the coasts. So with all three of these, you might note that climate change is actually not included explicitly in any of our principles. And that's because in the same way that we call nature-based approaches approaches, these are sort of the core the core concepts, the core principles that we want people to begin to feel, address, um, and move forward with. And in those ways, it'll help shape our future relationship with our planet, with our coasts, and address some of those issues that we see coming from climate change and hopefully change the way that we relate with our coasts. You know, Boston is a city that is still grappling with its identity as a coastal city, as a beach city, as a city with 34 islands and peninsulas, with the history of the harbor cleanup and, you know, the big dig and having much more access to the waterfront. Um, this is something that we're hoping to really see the needle shift on in terms of people identifying with Boston as a coastal city. This is the place that we go to live and play with along the water and also support our non-human neighbors. So the different plants, animals, algae, fungi um, that also call Boston home. So with all of these principles, we really bear these in mind as we create programming and outreach for all ages from littles of two and three all the way up to professional adults or retirees. Next slide. So as I mentioned, we have several buckets of uh, kinds of education and outreach that we do through the lab, each one kind of tailored to different scopes of audiences. So with this first kind of pop-up programming, we typically see sort of the general audience where we might have 
folks who are walking by the Boston Harbor Welcome Center um, on the right here, either on their way to a ferry or exploring the city in the summer months, or on the left, as Joe alluded to, this is one of our Wicked High Tide events where in the fall months when the weather's a little bit better um, and the high tides are falling during the daytime, this is the kind of flooding that we'll see. And so we set up shop at the end of Long Wharf and are doing really outreach programming about what is happening, why is this happening, and start to think about what are roles that we could play in the future. And so these are the kinds of programs that we either have scheduled programming or pop-up events. And with our the image on the right, this is our climate cart. So we have several activities that we implement, which are all really about just exploring what are the climate change threats to Boston and what are some ways that we could start to mitigate them and what are some of the pros and cons. So really, rather than pointing to a specific solution or saying this is the answer, having folks have the opportunity to explore those themselves and start to ask questions and really get engaged you know, with these kinds of topics. And our climate cart travels all over the city, um, particularly in the summer months, but our programming, if you can believe it, has already picked up. So we've been programming at the Children's Museum. We'll be at various STEM fairs this spring, and then really ramping up for the summer months, um, going all over the city, bringing, bringing the cart and our activities to folks all over. Next slide. One of our other big focuses is youth engagement, and we have two really big buckets in the ways that we engage with young people specifically in Boston. So uh, both of the, the ways that we engage with young people are in very close partnership with our partners at the National Parks of Boston. So working with the Park Service, we've actually implemented and piloted two lesson series with fifth graders in East Boston, which is an environmental justice community. So we created four standards-based lessons, first in 2022, and then a new set in 2023. And we implemented curriculum that, again, was about starting to think about how, our, how do we measure change? What are changes we can observe? And then how are those changes themselves changing in the future? So the student in the picture on the left here is doing some phenological observations. So phenology is the study of change, particularly with the seasons. So we started to talk about how do different native species know when the seasons are changing? And what might it mean if the signals that different species use, light, temperature, start to mismatch? And so this is a student doing some scientific observation, learning about how do you create scientific drawings? And then on the right here, we have uh, one of our teacher participants of our institute that I'll be talking about in a moment, engaging with some of our, our partner youth programs. So there are many programs throughout the city, especially in the summer months, who employ youth. This is one of our Park Service youth partners, but groups like Save the Harbor, Save the Bay, the trustees and others already have these youth cores that are environmentally focused. So rather than the Stone Living Lab saying, we're gonna create our own youth core, we're working with existing very you know, well-rounded, well-grounded programs to bring in that climate change expertise. So we do field excursions, we do career exploration, explorations centered around field science. Next slide. So I alluded to uh, the Teacher Institute in the last slide. So this is one of our um, most, or one of our proudest programs that we have. So this year will be the third year of our Teacher Institute. This is a free five-day professional development course for Boston area teachers. Um, and we're particularly focused on middle to high school teachers. And it's all about engaging around climate change through the lens of place-based education and participatory science. So we bring in up to 15 teachers each year. Um, they join us for a week in the summer. We explore sites all over Boston. And then those participants go back to their schools and create this place-based curriculum that they can then implement. This is a picture from last year's cohort, um, our, our proud cohort of 11 teachers. And all of these teachers received a thousand dollar stipend as well to buy supplies uh, for their students and then implemented programming from water quality testing a local pond, doing year long phenology observations of a forest nearby, measuring carbon capture and sequestration of trees um, in their schoolyard. So really figuring out ways to get students out learning about climate change and learning some real life skills. 
Currently, climate change is not in the uh, Massachusetts state standards. So really by working directly with teachers, we can get that learning and that education out to students now, um, and then hopefully push for some change internally. This QR code here um, on the screen is for information about this year's Institute. Our applications are open. So if you know any Boston area public school teachers who might be interested, please share this with them. Um, we're, as I said, applications are open right now for our July summer course. Next slide. And then finally, um, one of the other pieces that we continue to grow and pilot is our participatory, previously called citizen science programming. So this is a way for us to develop and pilot um, protocols where folks who are non-traditional scientists don't have PhDs or degrees in science um, and are really curious and interested in learning more about their environment can get involved with real world research. So on the left is an image from our piloted beach profiling program. So this is where uh, residents and folks went out and actually measured the slope or the shape of their beach every month for a year. And it allowed us to track how do Boston beaches change over the year? Something that happens naturally seasonally. And we learned that some of the beaches are really dynamic. Some of them are a little bit more static and it really is tied to where the islands are. So it helped to uh, bolster up our understanding of the role the islands play in protecting our harbor. The image on the right has some of our researchers uh, who are doing intertidal monitoring. So the intertidal zone is underwater at high tide and exposed at low tide. And we are really starting to explore how is this habitat being impacted by change and climate change? And we found that the temperatures that these creatures are having to tolerate are exponentially high in the summer months. So we were getting habitat that was nearly 115 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer, which is really at the extreme for a lot of these native species to be able to tolerate. So this is something that we're continuing to develop and pilot, looking at overland flooding protocols and figuring out ways that we can continue to um, have folks feel empowered to ask questions about their own environment and inform the research that we're doing. So definitely stay tuned for some of our future projects as well. That was amazing, Rebecca, thank you. Um, want to briefly cover uh, our policy innovation and climate preparedness work um, as well. Um, we, in addition to uh, Jessica Loquist's research on, on policy that, that I mentioned, um, we're also working with the, the Urban Ocean Lab, one of our partners uh, in, in New York City, um, uh, about uh, analyzing existing uh, regula regulations that, that help uh, enable or restrict nature-based approaches to climate adaptation. Um, and um, our, our two core partners, you know, um, Boston Harbor Now and UMass Boston, also um, last year uh, filed uh, legislation uh, called an act to promote research and demonstration project for nature-based approaches in Massachusetts, um, which is a bill that um, is, is currently being reviewed and, and uh, several other of our partner organizations have filed similar bills. So really hope to see some movement um, uh, on that this year uh, for, for regulatory reform that would, would help enable um, uh, better use of, of nature-based approaches because there are, are certain regulations that, that do restrict it in some ways, especially as many of you on this call know how we can work in the intertidal zone. Um, on the climate preparedness front, um, you know, uh, uh, we have a, a, a fantastic communications manager who's who's not here today, but uh, Brittany Knotts is um, doing wonderful work to to get the the, the message out there about the work. Is uh, sharing the work is is just as important as as doing it to be able to get it into the the hands of, of residents and, and interested uh, researchers of all types and and uh, practitioners, as we mentioned, and other academics. So. Um, some recent examples of that include um, Rebecca being featured in uh, the recent inundation district um, the documentary, um, uh, a, a uh, op-ed uh, that you see below about uh, that Kathy Abbott and I wrote about adapting to water rather than, than fighting it. Uh, Paul Kirshen, our research director, um, is sharing some information on local news. Um, and, and uh, me doing the same on the bottom left there, and then a, a podcast with um, the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Engineering with Nature program that, that we were recently featured on as well. Um, 
our 2023 conference, um, uh, which was less than a year ago, but feels like it was almost a decade ago in some ways, um, was uh, just an unbelievable couple of days. Um, two days at UMass Boston and then a day of field trips um, in April of 2023. And, and we just had uh, such a, a, a wonderful time there. Um, uh, we had over um, 50 workshops throughout those uh, three days, um, uh, both at UMass and in the field, uh, brought together just so many wonderful people who, who are working in this field and wanting to learn more and, and just to collaboratively learn and inspire. And, and we really can't wait for the next one. So we're getting planning on that now. Um, so keep an eye out uh, in your inboxes for more information on that. But we're, we're currently aiming for um, around the same time in, in April of, of 2025. Um, and a couple of pictures from from that on the right is is one of those um, field trips. This one um, along the waterfront near Pierce Park in East Boston um, for a walking tour uh, there. And on the left, this was one of our um, uh, two. Uh, well, we had we had several keynote events actually, um, but this was probably the single best panel I'd ever been to at a conference. It was unbelievable. It was an Indigenous Knowledge Fireside Chat um, featuring um, Elizabeth Solomon, who is um, an executive committee member um, uh, from the Massachusetts Tribe, uh, Stone Living Lab executive committee member, uh, but she's from the Massachusetts Tribe at Ponkapog. Um, it was uh, Chuck Sams, who is the National Park Services Director, who was uh, in town at that time and, and was able to join the conference uh, for this chat. And then the City of Boston's um, Chief of uh, Energy, Environment, and Open Space, uh, Mariama White Hammond. And just uh, the recording of that is online um, if you weren't there. And it is just really uh, worth watching and, and understanding how Indigenous knowledge can um, really benefit uh, climate adaptation work. Um, looking ahead into 2024 uh, and 2025, uh, beyond just our conference, uh, we're really excited about the Living Seawalls installation this spring that I had mentioned, um, the cobble berm uh, work going on this spring as well. Uh, excited about enhancing the real-time monitoring in Boston Harbor network um, and installing new instrumentation, including those two additional hohonus that I mentioned. Um, always launching new projects and, and partnerships. Um, as, as I mentioned, we have some work going on with the Urban Ocean Lab down um, in New York uh, that, that will be coming out later this year that we're excited about. So much summer programming that Rebecca gave a, a nice preview about, um, planning for our 2025 conference. Our monthly seminar series, please check that out. Um, uh, we always have, uh, I'm not sure if we have one planned for March yet, but um, it'll be going, we, we, we will uh, finish that soon and it'll be going up on our events page on our website. So always keep an eye on that for upcoming event. And, and just continuing to work with, with residents, partners, and, and all of you. And we really appreciate you all joining here today and look forward to any questions and conversation and, and always find out more on our, our terrific website um, that, that Brittany, who I think is in the audience here, is uh, doing a great job managing. Um, so I think, uh, Rebecca, do you have any other closing thoughts about 2024 and 2025? No, I just think that, um, as we mentioned, we're always looking to partner, pilot, try out new things. So um, if you are in the, the Boston Harbor area and this is something that you want to hear more about, want to partner in programming on or, you know, have us come and, and talk to folks about, we're always happy to do that. And really just continuing to connect folks, network, spread knowledge, share programming. Um, and all of our educational resources that we use are up on our website as well and freely available for downloads. So that's one of the big highlights um, for our projects is as we continue to bring the monitoring network on online um, and other pieces is making this as publicly available as possible. So making sure that the, the data, the programming, um, event recordings, all that is available on our website so folks can, can really take it and run with it and adapt it to their own locations. Thanks, Rebecca. And in addition to uh, at the website, you can always find us um, at our email addresses here as well as on Instagram, uh, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And I, I think I hand it back to Kelly and uh, the, 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 we hand it back to Kelly and Al now, right? You do. Awesome. Should I stop sharing screen here? Um, yeah, Kelly, sure. I think you're right. 
Rebecca. Yeah, go for it. All right. Well, Rebecca and Joe, thank you. That was great. And, you know, even for those of us who are familiar with uh, the Living Lab uh, and its work to see everything, uh, you know, updated and, and organized like that is very valuable for us. Um, I'm, I'm going to begin. Oh, well, let me let me just introduce the Q&A before I jump in and ask a question. Um, there are two ways uh, for those of you in the audience. Uh, you can ask a question, uh, either put it in the chat um, or uh, use the raise uh, the electronic raise hand function, Kelly will monitor those uh, and miraculously juggle both of them um, and, uh, and and get through the questions. Um, uh, I wanted to lead off with a question. Uh, Joe, you, uh, you mentioned, uh, and it's obviously very important, uh, the regulatory issues uh, confronting this whole enterprise uh, and the, uh, uh, and, and the legislation that's hopefully, hopefully moving now, but can I ask you to just elaborate a little bit there folks on this call who are in the middle of this debate every day, uh, but others who are uh, familiar with it in a more general kind of way. Can you talk about the degree to which the existing regulatory environment uh, is challenging, A, to the sort of pilot and experimental stage uh, of work that, that the lab is, is primarily doing now, uh, you know, in, in the water uh, that, that, that touches that jurisdiction, uh, and also looking ahead uh, to uh, to the challenges, uh, you know, as they would impact doing these things at scale. Uh, sure thing, Al. Great question. Um, so I'll I'll try to keep it sort of at the the big picture because um, once you start to get into the uh, proverbial and and literal weeds on this, it gets a little uh, a little uh, <laughs> um, boring. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not to us. <laughs> Not to us, correct. Um, so at, at, at the big picture, what the challenges really are, are there are lots of state and local regulations in place um, from uh, Chapter 91 to, um, uh, you know, DP regulations to um, uh, local uh, wetlands regulations that are in place for very good reason for uh, environmental protection that were much needed when they were established. Um, however, they did not account for the challenges of climate change and they're being adapted and updated to do so, uh, but some um, uh, need to do that a little bit more and, and, and a little bit quicker. Um, in addition to really being able to reflect the challenges of climate change, especially sea level rise, a shortening intertidal zone is, is one of the big challenges there and, and the potential need for, for fill. Um, th they also need to make sure that um, research is being prioritized and is a use that is um, getting maybe a, a little bit um, more flexibility than it currently does. So is is that a fair summary, Al, to sort of say it, it's it's really trying to allow for for um, the adapting to the nuances of climate change, better in work in the intertidal zone, uh, considerations for fill, and then better considerations for for research projects. Yeah, and, and yeah, and, and obviously I asked it with the with, with the thought that you'd you'd answered a relatively high level, and I haven't looked in the chat, but there may be more specific questions about that as well. So, uh, Kelly, I will uh, hand the control over to you uh, to field all these questions. Thank you. Okay. We have one question in the chat. And a reminder, if you have any questions, feel free to put it in the chat and also raise your hand virtually like Chris Bush has. I'm going to jump to the chat first and then I'll get to Chris. Um, Eric has a thought. It's easy to imagine how living seawalls could lower wave impacts, but how could they also potentially reduce storm surge as well? Uh, Eric, great question. Uh, I misspoke when I said that. Uh, I was trying to say that uh, mitigating uh, wave impacts. So uh, you're absolutely right on that. That is what we'll be looking at, um, how they are enhancing biodiversity, hopefully um, improving water quality related to that. And then, yes, um, potentially lowering uh, wave impacts. Cool. Thank you. Um, Eric, I hope that answers your question. If not, feel free to put a follow up. Um, let's pass it off to Chris Well. Hey, thanks, Kelly. Good to see you this morning and uh, uh, good to see you as well, Joe. Thanks for all the good work you and Rebecca are doing with the lab. Um, sorry if I miss this, but uh, the state has this new resilient coasts initiative, which seems like it'd be a good 
fit uh, for the work of the lab. I'm just wondering if there's been much engagement with CZM and the state with, with the good work the lab is doing and how to integrate that in with the state's Resilient Coast Initiative. Uh, great question, Chris. That That is a really exciting new program. We, we probably should have included that in the presentation. You're right. Um, uh, so both uh, myself, uh, Paul Kirshen, um, our research director uh, over at UMass Boston, as well as Kathy Abbott, uh, president and CEO of Boston Harbor Now, are, are actually all on the 20-person uh, uh, external steering committee for the Resilient Coast program and, and working to make sure that the lab's work is sort of uh, incorporated into and informing resilient coasts and that, uh, you know, the the uh, opposite is happening as well, that the resilient coast program is helping inform the, the direction of the, the lab's work. Um, so great, great question. And, and, and yeah, we should definitely uh, incorporate that into future presentations. Awesome. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Joe, do you want to just outline sort of what the goals of that, what that team is? Yeah, uh, I mean the the program is evolving. It's it's really exciting. It was just launched um, late last year, um, and it is really trying to provide a a framework a framework for um, how coastal resilience planning is is done uh, throughout uh, coastal Massachusetts and helping uh, provide municipalities with better. Um, uh, tools and resources and, and connections uh, to be able to do so in collaboration with the state. Great. Um, if there are any other questions, once again, raise your hand virtually or put it in the chat. If you're having difficulty raising your hand virtually, you go to the reaction section um, and there should be a button to raise your hand. There's also um, if you do have your video on and you wave your hand, I think I can find you. Um, <laughs> I do want to ask a question myself as like host privilege, I'm going to ask it. What makes a site a good site for um, sort of nature based approaches? And when is a site not the best suited for that? Great question, Kelly. Um, always having your urban planning hat on. I love it. Um, uh, so, um, implementing nature-based approaches in dense urban areas, um, like Boston, especially older dense urban areas can be tough. Um, one of the most important things you need is space. Um, that, that's really <laughs> kind of maybe the most important factor. You, you saw those pictures of the cobble berms and how much space they take up on, you know, a, a shoreline. Well, a, a vertical granite seawall uh, takes up much less space. And so, you know, we don't uh, at the lab vilify gray infrastructure, you know, it's needed in places, um, but we champion nature-based approaches to make sure that people are always considering, trying to consider that first um, because of, you um, not only its performance, but its co-benefits that we talked about, um, and and really um, thinking about the ways that that can uh, really tie into a community a little bit more holistically than a, a wall that's just cutting that community off from the water, the waterfront and water access. And I think something that's a really fascinating feature of particularly Boston um, is that about seventy percent of Boston's footprint is engineered um, post-colonization. So what was initially the Shawmut Peninsula um, became Boston. And so this is something we're a highly engineered city already. Um, and so the ways in which we can continue to now do engineering that's through a, a different lens of not just let's carve out hills and fill in the, you know, fill in the ocean and build Boston, but instead what are ways that we can actually, you know, engineer into the future in a way that is one that's, uh, will allow Boston to continue living with the water. And it's pretty fascinating if you look at maps that show where the water once was around Boston, where the water is predicted to go, there's a very uncanny overlap. Um, so that's one of the really interesting things is that Boston's sort of returning to its initial shape in a lot of ways and even just from sort of a, a philosophical you know debate it's one that's pretty fascinating in terms of the history of boston and, and where it could be going 
That was so well said, Rebecca. C completely agree. And and those maps she referenced are uh, just incredible. You can find them at the Leventhal Center, and it really shows Boston's evolving shoreline from when colonists first arrived, you know, to 2020, and then puts a layer on top of it of the future sea level rise projections through uh, Climate Ready Boston and the Boston Harbor, Massachusetts coastal um, uh, projections. And when you're looking at 40 inches of sea level rise that's estimated around 2070, and you map that over the 1620 footprint, like Rebecca said, it's it's unbelievable that it's almost a, a match for where the water is going to go is where it once was. So yeah, thinking about nature-based approaches in that way. And, and then also there are certain areas, and, and we are talking about this at the lab and studying it and working with our partners at the Urban Harbors Institute who are doing great work on this about, about managed retreat and strategic retreat. And when you do start to plan for that in areas, and there will be parts of, of our region that, that very much need to consider that sooner rather than later, uh, there's currently planning initiatives going on in Hull around that topic. Um, Nature-based approaches, implementing them now, help ease that transition, right? Um, and uh, thinking about how that nature-based approach can be something that, that yes, buys a, a neighborhood some more time, uh, but that eventually can help it return to nature as as some some will need to. Thank you. That was super helpful, and it's good to hear about all of the different creative solutions, whether they be scary or co-beneficial to have all range of solutions talked about. Um, and also thank you for sharing those maps in the chat. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Jean and then I'm gonna hop that to the chat for Eric's question. Jean, feel free to unmute yourself. I am unmuted. <laughs> um, I'm curious about the project with Australia. Um, are you expecting organisms and creatures to grow on those um, unevenly shaped hexagonal platforms? And also I'm wondering about what I've heard with oyster shells in bags being put along a coast to sort of promote wildlife and provide some stability. Thanks. Rebecca, could I jump in first and then and then pass it to you? Um, great questions. Um, so yes, uh, we are very much uh, th those um, panels. The living seawalls panels are, are are meant to mimic um, natural crevices, um, and and we are expecting a, a lot of biodiversity accumulation. If our lead researcher Jarrett Burns were here today, I was just out at one of the sites with him the other day. Um, uh, along with Alice Brown, who's on the call today. Hi, Alice. Um, uh, if he were here, he would he would talk in in detail about exactly what uh, he's excited to to see happen on those panels. Um, uh, and um, I, I won't try to replicate exactly uh, the enthusiasm that he brings to that. But but yes, we we are really optimistic that. Um, even in a cold water environment like Boston, most of these um, the, the living seawalls. Um, uh, organizations, panels have been implemented in, in warmer water environments, but we think even in this cold water environment, we're going to see a lot of accumulation of, of, of aquatic life and, and are really excited about that um, happening as early as a year into them being um, uh, attached to the existing wall. And with oysters, um, oyster shells, a, a great question. Um, so we are always keeping our eye on the Living Breakwaters Project in Staten Island, which is uh, in partnership with the Billion Oyster Project um, and just an incredible example of an at scale nature-based approach um, right here on the Eastern Seaboard. Um, a partner that we've worked with before, SCAPE is the one of the project leads on that. Um, and and we have um, been having conversations with the Massachusetts Oyster Project um, about exactly how to think about that too. There are some regulations that uh, restrict the ways in which uh, <laughs> oysters can um, uh, can help benefit uh, you know the area, especially in Boston Harbor. Um, but that is something that we're exploring with the Massachusetts Oyster um, Project now, which you should definitely check out. They're doing really cool work. Um, Rebecca, you want to add to uh, some context on those? Yeah, and I think um, the other piece in terms of the the Living Seawalls Project is we're sort of expecting to see 
kind of a succession of accumulation. Bioaccumulation is the term for as different critters come and uh, settle on those panels. So we might see, you know, in the first six months, a year, mainly algae species coming. And then we'll, we'll expect to see things like periwinkles, snails, and then sort of moving up the food chain where we would hope to see mussels, maybe some oysters, um, and then even fish coming to rest, explore, um, creating these sort of microhabitats that we hope could then be replicated um, further around the city. And yeah, we know that oysters, live oysters are a real hero of of um, the the ocean in terms of water quality cleaning and also providing stabilization. Uh, the techniques of using like oyster bags or even coconut fiber is another one that's used a lot in restoration. So there's actually a project in Winthrop that we've been monitoring for several years called Coughlin Park. And when they were doing shoreline restoration, they used um, these rolled, it's called coir, coir? Uh, rolled coconut fibers, which are then embedded underneath the, the sediment to stabilize the shoreline. Um, but oyster, oyster bags, those are another great solution. Joe was actually on a trip several months ago in the Netherlands where they were using a potato starch based structure to then do salt marsh salt marsh restoration. So the structure itself breaks down and then the salt marsh is there. So all of these techniques are definitely being utilized. I think one of the big challenges in Boston, again, is that we have such a majority hardened shoreline, that seawall, that there's less um, restoration going on in its purest sense where we could go and add fill and plant uh, you know, salt marsh and put in these stabilizers. We really need to think about what are ways that we can work with this hardened, you know, right angle seawall to build out, build up, um, soften it. And so that's where some of the difference between what's going on in Boston proper versus some of the neighboring communities, Hull, Duxbury, the North Shore, et cetera. Thank you, team. I'm very curious about this potato starch. Well, uh, buckle up, because I'm going to share a picture of it. Um, uh, if I can navigate to it one second, because uh, I, I, yeah, when Rebecca mentioned that, we were just looking at this yesterday afternoon and, and I wanted to to share it here. Um, uh, here you go. Let me share screen here. Um, so this is a, a photo essay from that trip that Rebecca mentioned on our website. And you can see um, here, this is exactly what she's talking about. Um, the restoration, the, these uh, uh, structures are made from potato starch. Um, and it's, uh, I forget the name of the company in the, in the Netherlands, uh, Base Elements, uh, you see it there in the caption. And so this is like, I think this one had been, is about three months old. Um, you see them here kind of established at about a year old. Um, and then this one, uh, uh, was, um, I'm not sure how long this has been here, but but significantly longer. So, um, pretty pretty exciting um, technique as well. That is so cool. Um, all right, I'm gonna shift gears for just a second and move to Eric's question, and he wants to know more about the switch from nature based approaches to nature based or nature from nature-based solutions to nature-based approaches and what was the logic behind sort of the rebrand? Can I take that one, Joe? Yeah, please do, yeah. <laughs> Mainly because I was on the working group that was exactly about this conversation, Eric. So, um, you know, there's several different factors that came into us shifting this terminology. Um, so nature-based solutions is sort of the uh, field accepted term, you know, this is what we see in journals and academic and technical papers. But when we were, really starting to establish ourselves as the lab and start to think about what do we mean by nature-based. Uh, we started having some really nice philosophical conversations, particularly with uh, Elizabeth Solomon, who is an elder of the Massachusetts tribe of Ponkapog, where, you know, she was really pushing us on with these kinds of projects. Are we saying that we're working with nature for nature, or are we continuing to sort of use nature for human benefit? Um, and so we know that kind of business as always in terms of how Western culture has developed 
even if we think specifically Boston, how Boston was built, the sort of attitudes we have towards um, our non-human neighbors and quote resources um, has gotten us to the, the issue of where we are. So really trying to be mindful of, okay, first, what do we mean by nature-based? Who is nature a partner? Are we considering you know, the water, the rocks, the plants, the animals themselves as partners, as equal players in these projects? And then the second piece is that these aren't solutions to the threats facing Boston, the world itself, in terms of climate change. We know that the solutions are much bigger. It's, you know, cutting fossil fuels, it's decarbonization, it's all these different pieces that, you know, as a broad global society, we need to really start to shift on. Instead, we're viewing these as approaches or strategies. What are some ways that we can start to mitigate or adapt to some of these, you know, using this targeted approach, knowing that it needs to sort of ripple out in terms of how can these approaches start to create a broad cultural shift. One of the things I really value about the lab is that we're having these kinds of conversations alongside the research. So not just conducting this research and going out into the field, but also stepping back and having these conversations about what do we really mean when we're doing this? What are we, you know, what are we protecting? What are we prioritizing uh, when we do this kind of work? And even earlier when Joe mentioned the term managed retreat um, or strategic retreat, we know from our partners at Urban Harbor Institute that the literal term managed retreat is very triggering and a huge turnoff for a lot of people who live in these in these neighborhoods because especially in the United States the idea of retreat is really you know makes people you know tense up and say no we're not retreating this isn't defeat um so what even in that terminology can we start to shift the terminology when we say this isn't a retreat what we're trying to say is you know we need to change the way that we live our lives? How do we interact with a naturally very dynamic ecosystem? You know, it's kind of a, in some ways, it's kind of a human problem that folks came in and built permanent structures on a very naturally um, dynamic ecosystem. When we think about places even like Cape Cod that sees naturally three feet of erosion per year, we shouldn't be building structures that we expect to last 500 years. So a lot of it is thinking about shifting our own perspective. Um, and then especially in terms of these approaches, these are strategies that we want to use to help prepare for the future. And they're not gonna solve um, the issues that we know are already here or coming our way. Amazing insights, Rebecca, great narrative. No, nothing to add there, that was perfect. All right, I'm gonna do one last call for any questions please feel free to put them in the chat, virtually raise your hand, or if you are so inclined to physically raise your hand, I will do my best to find you. Um, yeah, I'm gonna give it a few more seconds. Well, I, I, I will say a quick thank you if it's okay. We really appreciate you having us, Kelly and, and, and Al and, and everybody who joined today, uh, really, really enjoyed the, the conversation and, and thank you so much for joining. The same goes likewise. We really appreciate all of the wisdom and knowledge you just imparted. Um, it's such an interesting topic that I don't get to work with every day. And so I'm really pleased to have learned something new, even though we are partners and we talk all the time. Like I still learn new things every day. Potato starch is such a fascinating <laughs> um, material. Um, but truly, it was lovely to have you both. And Al, thank you once again for always being our fearless leader in moderating these chats. Okay. Um, and thank you. Okay. Yep, uh, you're, you're more than welcome. More importantly, Joe and Rebecca, thank you. That was that was really wonderful. Uh, let me just wrap up uh, beyond thank you by saying that, uh, as Kelly said at the beginning, uh, this session was recorded. And if anybody wants to get that recording uh, or the recording of uh, any of these past hobby use forums, uh, they're available on YouTube, and Kelly's going to put that link in the chat. Um, and uh, in general, you can learn more about Boston Harbor Now uh, and everything we're doing and upcoming events and all the rest of it uh, at our website, bostonharbornow.org. Uh, uh, please feel free when you're there to sign up for uh, monthly email updates, uh, follow us on social media, uh, and do all the other things one does to follow uh, something interesting. Uh, have a great rest of uh, your Wednesday and uh, stay dry and thank you all very much. Thank you.
Thanks, everyone.